This presentation, as I mentioned, is uh, from Integrated Engineering Software. It's Dr. Doug Cragen. He's team leader of the benchmark and testing for the company. In the last 30 years, Dr. Cragen has done diverse work in academia and industry. He's taught and researched at Acadia University and the University of Winnipeg. For the last 20 years, he's worked at Integrated uh, Engineering with scientists and engineers around the world, assisting them in making decisions about how best to use software for simulations in diverse electromagnetic applications. So there's a screen. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Randy, and thank you for everyone who's watching for giving me your time. Um, I'm actually talking about the very opposite end of the whole design and usage chain to, to the previous talk by Chris. Um, the people who use our software are typically the design engineers who are actually creating the components in a way that generates the electric field patterns that either do or don't create discharges as needed. So where he's talking about discharges creating problems in the final device, um, I'm dealing with people who are trying to design the equipment in the first place so that those don't happen where they're not wanted. So. Um, when I wrote the title and abstract for the talk a few months ago, of course, I hadn't yet given much thought to what to talk about. And they're still applicable, but I'll just mention in advance um, that as I, as I looked at what I was going to talk about, namely, what are the common strategies for um, using design software to avoid problems? Um, I realized it, that I thought I could do better than, than these uh, standard procedures by using automation that wasn't available when they were developed in the first place. So, so um, the talk is going to transition a little beyond that, but still within, within the scope described. <clears throat> so historically, of course, there weren't computers, there weren't very much, but... Um, but there was some basic theories and types that would let people design equipment according to simple rules. So if you want a uniform electric field, two parallel plates, um, you know, that gives you a uniform field. Uh, you, you have lots of devices that fall into simple categories, like the parts around here are basically concentric spheres. The parts around here are basically cylinders and cylinders within cylinders. And in undergraduate electromagnetic courses, you um, learn uh, the formulas that apply to those, uh, um, which are summarized in this slide here. <clears throat> so when you're looking at a device, and here I just show like if I had a cylinder applied some voltage sitting in empty space, um, it has a uniform field in the middle. If it's very long, it'll be a long uniformish field. But towards the ends, uh, something else happens. Towards the ends where devices actually terminate at the ends of your wires and, and where things connect to each other, something different happens. It's hard to predict. Um, and it tends to involve sharp corners or sharp transitions. Uh, sharp transitions from material to material often gives something uh, called a triple point problem. But uh, you have this combination of parts that are reasonably understood and controlled, like the middle and then terminations, where you see it disappearing red to clear. That's simply because the field actually becomes arbitrarily large towards that edge. So. I chose to cut off the plot at a point where I could still see color, but it would just, it, um, if I let it auto scale and display everything, it would just be red exactly around the boundary and, and a uniform color everywhere else because the boundary would swamp everything else. <clears throat> so, so one strategy to deal with that is obviously you can easily round it things. So, I round at the end, I go from here, cylindrical parts of a device will generate fields that decay as one over the radius. 
spherical parts will generate fields that decay as one over radius squared. And so naturally your spherical cap won't be infinite like this. So you solved the extreme field problem, but you haven't solved the problem that it's bigger than it was in the middle. And it's a pity to have to, you know, make, let's say a cable or a cylinder of some type in a device much larger than you really wanted it to be just to, because the way you're capping the end of it um, requires that. <clears throat> so let's look at a much longer cylinder and consider a couple of alternatives. Since the field decays is one over R squared, um, the obvious thing is rather than just round the end, like you see over on the right here, we'll put a ball on the end of a larger radius. So um, on this scale, I've, uh, ch I've shown you can see this is semi-log. So we span many orders of magnitude here because the field actually decays very quickly right around the geometry. But you can see uh, kind of visually the uniform gradient in color on a logarithmic scale as I go away, that indicates it is indeed behaving somewhat like one over R as expected. So I go to a linear scale and zoom in on the two ends and you see that, yes, the smaller rounded end, I'm using the same scale here, in this case is giving 62 volts per meter around the rounding. The larger where I put a sphere on is more like 40, but the middle part of the rod was only down around 20 or 30. So this, uh, this size uh, sphere at the end hasn't quite done it for me yet. So maybe I'll try a bigger one and so on. Basic, um, basic uh, variation of parameters uh, is readily possible in software or in the field. You know, if you're actually observing sparks fly, um, you can just try different size spheres uh, tied on to the end and uh, see what works for you. <clears throat> but uh, the, the neat thing about software is that you can experiment with arbitrary shapes and designs. And the question is how to come up with them and, and draw them. So here I've uh, um, used the method that I'll describe later, uh, my own method to figure out what is a rounding for the end of this, which is not spherical by any means, but a rounding for the end where the field on the rounded part nowhere exceeds the field along the middle part. So again, my normal assumption is that the, the kind of long parts of a device um, that are easy to analyze have been designed to meet some kind of uh, known criteria such as a maximum critical field. And the, the standard goal I'm going to be assuming is we're designing terminations that don't exceed what I see over here. And, uh, and so we can come up with ways of doing that. Um, questions like what's the most practical way to uh, to uh, machine or or assemble parts, you know, those aren't those aren't for us. We're we're in the area of what actually works. Decisions about what what is good to manufacture and so on are for other people. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, the the assumed goal that I'll use throughout this is that we have some part that meets a criteria and we're trying to make terminations that don't exceed that criteria. And uh, the criteria I'm going to come up with are very ad hoc sounding, I'm sure. That's by design. I don't talk about things that I learned from our users. I don't want to ever accidentally say something that I thought was general knowledge in the industry, but was in fact, um, something that a given user considered their own, their own intellectual property. So I will talk in very broad terms with reasonably simple looking devices because of that. And, uh, and the uh, criteria that I specify will be fairly simple. Um, the two pieces of our software that will be featured in different things, anything that's two dimensional or axisymmetric, that is cylindrical type shapes, 
um, are used using a program called Electro. Anything that's fully three-dimensional are using a program called Coulomb. So let's take it, this as our first design example to kind of illustrate um, what, uh, what software is typically doing when people are designing, designing this sort of thing. We'll take the design challenge of making a spark gap in this case. So we deliberately want to spark, but we don't want end effects to do things that are going to be problematic. Like we want it to spark, let's say when we turn on a power source that puts 15 kilovolts on one electrode, a minus 15 kilovolts on another electrode, um, producing a field of 30 kilovolts per centimeter along a line down the middle. And we don't want fields somewhere that are going to spark at a different voltage. So, so uh, we want to design to avoid that. <clears throat> so we need to quantify that somehow. So I, I came up with what I think are probably overly stringent conditions, but for me, they're just an example of we, we need to say, what does uniform mean? Nothing you build is ever uniform to arbitrary precision. We need to actually specify some precision number in order to be able to do anything. So I'm assuming that uh, we don't want to vary by more than 0.1 kilovolt per centimeter along our intended 30 kilovolt per centimeter path. And uh, that means between 29.9 and 30.1, and that we want nowhere in the device to exceed 30.1 kilovolts per centimeter. <clears throat> so again, whether these are overly stringent isn't, isn't really my concern. They're numbers pulled out to illustrate the method. So first it proposed design spheres. It's easy, you buy, you buy spheres in different sizes of metal, uh, put some connecting rod onto them, apply a voltage to them. So you can see in the software how that's done here. We define voltage at sources. We specify what volumes go into each of them. And if I have 15 kilovolts each on two electrodes, then where I want 30 kilovolts per centimeter on average between them, that should be a one centimeter gap, simple math. Um, voltage difference divided by distance is the average field. So, so if I make this with any radius spheres, but put plus and minus 15 kilovolts, one centimeter between them, that is on average my 30 kilovolts per centimeter. <clears throat> I'm not going to do this in 3D because there's no reason to. A general principle for saving yourself time and money with software like ours is anything you can do with two-dimensional simulation, you should, because it's faster, it's easier, um, just a lot less time messing around with drawing and so on, and the software is less expensive as well. So I don't help our company make money by saying that, but in all good conscience, I have to make that my recommendation. So the rods were drawn into the design, but they're really in an area that's not of much interest. So for the purpose here, what we're talking about is how do we figure out spheres that will solve the design criteria given. And uh, any problems associated with the rods themselves, and of course how they carry on beyond the model to connect to the sources is, is a whole other project. So let's look at the initial result. Um, when, I, when I drew the spheres and, and uh, made them um, basically one centimeter radius, that predicts a, a side field, a field going out into empty space if, if there is nothing else around, which is roughly what you should see at the side of 15 kilovolts per centimeter. So. Um, the small radius really means along the central line, the field is high. It shouldn't be very high any, anywhere else. It should decay away from that pretty quickly. And if we look, we can make a plot with the software. 
of the field along the center line and kind of trace with a mouse and watch a dot move up and down to see where we are. So we see our expected by the color scale here, our expected 15 kilovolts per centimeter at the sides. But we see we swamp, I limit the color scale to 30.1. So anywhere that goes white after red, I know exceeds my design criteria. <clears throat> so when I look here within the white, I put a sphere and I see this is actually 35. This isn't a little bit over the criteria. Um, I wanted to be within plus or minus 0.1 of 30, and instead I'm varying from 25 up to 41. So, so this is by no means uniform enough in here, but the design is nice in that I don't have any excessive fields anywhere else. So next obvious thing, try larger spheres. With uh, doubling the radius to two centimeters, um, I see this range decrease a bit. I now have the red line, which doesn't span as wide a range, but it is still well in excess of what I wanted. It's still well um, in excess of 29.9 to 30.1. So, so simply doubling the radius didn't get me very far. And of course, um, the field that's a high region is covering more and more space, but it's still at least decaying nicely away. There's no reason to think I would ever have edge problems simply by using spheres like this. So making it much bigger went to eight centimeters. And now we've got huge spheres compared to the gap. And this blue line is getting closer, but still arguably a pretty long ways away. We've got a big region exceeding my intended target here. <clears throat> so the sphere method looks like it's going to force me to use extremely large spheres. Um, we may not have to use entire spheres. Maybe we would use hemispheres um, because the field is low over here. I should have room to chop it round the ends a bit to prevent high fields and maybe get away with just portions of a sphere. But, but uh, the sphere method is easy, um, but it, it looks like at least for the criteria I gave, it's forcing me to, to go extremely large. So let's look at a whole other concept. Um, the next concept is to say, let's use a disc instead of a sphere. And again, plus or minus uh, 15, um, kilovolts. I need one centimeter gap between them for the flat sections. Um, the question is going to be um, how big a radius am I going to try out? And, and I should be doing a lot better than with the spheres because I've got a long section uh, that's one, one centimeter. So just as a starting guess, I'll do three. Um, a little larger than my second sphere trial. And in fact, that works out brilliant for the central goal. The central goal being give me my uniform 30 kilovolt per centimeter field down the middle. Now, when I set a range of 29.9 to 30.1, the field down the middle is easily well within that. But here's... A, Here's the uh, focus of, of this talk then. In order to get what I wanted, I created a big problem at the ends. I have a little bit of uh, a problem on the backside where the fields are lower anyways. I see the corner giving potentially a problematic field, um, but on the facing plates, on all these four corners, I see extremely large fields, well in excess of my design criteria. So I've opened the possibility that besides the intended spark here, I get a lot of discharge in this region. And then what happens with the fields around? That's another question, but at least it's some initial partial discharges, if not full sparking occurring here, maybe swamping what I'm looking for maybe occurring at voltages where I don't want sparking, but I want to get rid of that. Um, that's the reason for, for the criteria that we're, we were given is to avoid that. So let's 
Let's try a couple of modifications. Since we seem to have lots of margin for the field being uniform, we don't need the disc to be as large a radius. So went to a two centimeter radius. Um, and to get rid of the extreme fields on the corners, they were each rounded a bit. This one had a smaller extremity. So I rounded it to one millimeter. This one had a larger extremity. So I rounded it to five millimeters. And you see the field in the center is still quite, quite acceptable, the red line here. But uh, we haven't uh, really resolved these. Uh, this looks acceptable. I don't see any white area around the outside corners, but these inside corners have still got a good amount of, of rounding to them. So um, the animation won't show up in your PDF, of course, but I'll show an animation of the results for this in, in the presentation, at least. We can, from this point, say I'm going to take some guesses about what range of parameters I want to study. Um, I don't want to keep going one by one, redrawing, reanalyzing, and so on. I want to automate things as much as I can. So, so I made up a parametric that's going to do two things. It's going to try out different roundings of these four inside corners. And it's going to displace everything inwards by one centimeter as well. And it's going to do some sampling, like what's the field at this point, at this point, and so on, show a contour. And then I should be able to look at summaries of a large range of variations. So when I do that, the nicest way to look at the contours for me is a simple animation. Here you can see all of the contours presented by, by those results. And the thing that jumps out to me right away is that we're actually in a sense going from a disc to a sphere or a fraction of a sphere. Um, as we get large enough rounding and small enough initial, you see you can actually look at those as a continuum. So as we get too small and it looks too spherical, we don't expect good results because we didn't have good results with the sphere at this radius. <clears throat> as far as the central field goes, um, most of these variations were unacceptable too. This is my criterion, the red box. A number of them were acceptable, but a large number weren't. And so overall conclusion here, this parametric actually took a guess at studying the wrong range of parameters. So the next obvious thing is to go in the opposite direction. Let's make the disk a lot larger. Let's allow it to be thicker so that we can get, uh, get wider, um, wider radiuses of curvature on the ends. And when I do that, then you see, okay, now I'm able to get my uniform field and it spans a huge range now and my unacceptable fields are getting to be quite small. But here I've gone way up to a two centimeter thick plate, a uh, eight centimeter radius, and it's still not meeting my criteria. So um, if these sizes and weights and mass of copper, for example, are all getting to be excessive, this says maybe I want a whole other um, approach. So there's some standard alternatives besides flat sphere and, um, and uh, basic arc rounding, circular rounding. And one of them is the Bruce method, which as far as I know, has no theoretical basis. It's simply found to work. Um, the Bruce method, simply simply says, rather than rounding with an arc, I'm going to round with a cosine shape. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that's easy enough to do with uh, software, at least with our software, I won't speak for others, but uh, you can use Excel to generate arcs between intended points. Um, following a cosine shape. So I simply show this, if anyone wants to mimic it, you can just copy it out of the presentation later. Um, but you set up a formula that takes you from one to another and 
the way I, I'm going to demo everything I did for this presentation, I just made things in Excel, made up a button, I press it, a macro in Excel draws it in our software. Um, you can come up with lots of ways of getting data like this into software, but for me, just the button that I click that sends it in is, is a really nice solution. So I use the Bruce profile a couple of ways. One, I simply said, well, let's, uh, let's simply do a cosine from the start to the end of the disk, right? So, so I did that. Uh, that looks very much like our sphere case and unacceptably high fields here. So I said, well, let's do the other. Let's look at it basically as a plate, but instead of rounding with an arc, I'll round with a Bruce profile. And again, the results are very similar to what I got with the arc. So this method doesn't appear to be getting me very far. <clears throat> um, possibly if I played with it enough, I would. Um, so, so what I came up with eventually, I call a Rogowski-like procedure, um, or Rogowski, I should say. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I'll begin by just showing kind of a final result here. If I actually show in three dimensions a comparison between what I came up with and, and what I had with my rounded disc, this rounded disc, if I made it out of solid copper, would take up three kilograms of copper, and it still didn't meet my design requirement. But... It, with, um, with the procedure that I'll explain, I came up with a disc this much smaller visually, which used less than a tenth of the amount of copper and which very readily meets the requirement. If you look at the patterns on it, the field is very well within the design requirement along the center line and there's nothing that looks at all problematic as we go out towards the edges of the disc. <clears throat> so how did I come up with that? It was by, with the method that I'll illustrate, it was by looking at the justification for two other alternatives to the Bruce profile that I've seen, the um, Rogowski and the Borda methods. Both of these have analytic justifications for why these curves would work. And uh, I show on this slide, again, anybody who wants to create a spreadsheet to generate these, feel free to copy these, uh, these Excel screen captures. It's not, not hard to do this, so I claim no propriety over it. But you can basically take the formulas that you can find in the literature and make up a spreadsheet um, that will let you generate data that you can then use for machining if you're in, if you're building or if you're simulating that you can pull into software. Again, I do that by just pushing a button. <clears throat> so, so uh, let's look at the um, Rogowski profile and the justification that's given for it. What, what is the justification? If I look at two semi-infinite plates um, parallel to each other with it some uh, some voltage difference applied between them, we can analytically solve a simple problem like this and say, what is the voltage distribution and the electric field distribution around it? And uh, you see the expected problem with the field getting higher and higher and higher towards, uh, towards the corner itself. Um, but... Uh, but the key for, for understanding this profile is to look at the interaction between uh, voltage lines, um, the ones that I've drawn in purple here, and field, uh, uh, field equi um, electric field lines that are shown in the rainbow scale. And to say, okay, the field gets high towards the corner, but uh, we could actually physically make an electrode to follow any of these voltage lines. And there's an equivalence principle that says, if I did that, I would generate the same field. 
So I can use these equipotential lines to say, let's make an electrode with this shape. An electrode with this shape will have the field pattern seen in between. And I can use that to guide me to make, um, to make something which avoids a problem. So what is the, the standard uh, Rogowski profile is to say, I am going to look at the half, half size, half voltage. So in the middle, everything is uniform. If I go down a quarter of the distance, if I go up a quarter of the distance and ask what voltage contours am I mapping out? I'm mapping out the voltage contours corresponding to half the total gap and therefore half the total applied voltage. And the observation is that for this, um, for this particular setup, those actually exactly slice along the field, which, which nowhere exceeds the center value. So, so by following this profile contour, I'm able to, um, I'm able to make an electrode shape where it will nowhere give a larger field than what I have in the center. <clears throat> so, so this is the proposal is that you treat an arbitrary device as if it was infinite plates. Um, you design for twice the gap that you want. Um, and use use the profile corresponding to half of that, and that gives you a shape where the field will be nice towards the edges. So there's problems with this, of course. The obvious problem to me, since I I study uh, and benchmark things all the time, the theory doesn't apply to any real device. Um, it approximates some devices, yes, and it gives you a more intelligent way of making a profile for ones it doesn't apply to than simply arbitrarily saying, I want to try an arc, I want to try a cosine, but it's not actually correct. Um, so it's useful to the extent that a device is similar to semi-infinite place uh, plates, but but it's certainly not correct. But it might give you something that's a better starting point than the starting points I had uh, by starting with a a disc and rounded ends. I actually had such a bad initial design for my given criteria that that it's going to take a lot of time to optimize this. A closer starting point would be nice. <clears throat> so. What are some decisions to make? Well, um, besides it, the device itself is obviously not infinite. You can't make an infinite uh, electro, but uh, the profile predicts an infinitely long uh, voltage contour in some case. Um, well, in any case, in the 2D case, it always predicts infinitely long contour. So you need to decide how far into the plate am I going to terminate it on the left? How far at or beyond the intended corner am I terminating it on the right? And how do I round and so on um, wherever I do terminate it? So I've shown here um, some, some basic ideas um, where where I've drawn on, onto, a, onto a simple plate model. So, so I said, let's, let's draw something, a thin plate, apply a voltage to it, plus and minus. So I generate my fields and I look, here is the shape. This is, um, this is axisymmetric. So this is a disc, um, these thin plates. Here, I have the shape of the Rogowski profile. So by assuming that I want a profile that is based on semi-infinite plates, the edge of semi-infinite plates, I would produce this curve as my proposed shape for the electrode. Um, 
but with simulation, I'm not tied with having to come up with a theory. That's that's the magical insight that that I came up with as I was pondering all this. I can actually produce the very same idea, the very same strategy for anything. So I can say, rather than the infinite, I'm going to draw this as a double wide strip. So this is, I think this was three centimeters wide. I draw it as six centimeters wide, model it in 2D. So it's a very long strip in and out of the screen. And if I solve the fields and solve the voltage contour for that, I produce this. So I produce something with a smaller rounding. But then if I actually make it axisymmetric, only draw it as three, and, and I solve the actual disk that's very thin here, then I produce this profile. And that is, in fact, um, what, what I'm suggesting here. So the Rogowski profile works. Um, I, I constructed all three of them. I won't show them here, um, but you can choose a point up above where the fields are high, just cut, cut it there. Um, so a simulation, you can kind of look at a profile on, on your extreme model, look at a profile and say, okay, I'm gonna cut it here because the fields are small anyways. I'll do something like draw straight back to make the top and then I'll round the corner. And that all is pretty easy design. The, the hard design is avoiding these fields in the first place. Um, but, uh, but, um, but this, um, this uh, <clears throat> um, final one based on axisymmetry actually gives me the smallest electrode shape. So Rogowski, actually works, but it's maybe over-engineered. It gives me a larger radius than I want, and uh, and uh, how well it'll work for any given case is hard to predict. But, but you see here, I've come up with an electrode shape that's basically going to be this inside curve, terminate it somewhere, um, round the corner, and use that. And I'm doing it by basically using half the gap of my ad hoc known to be a problem electrode. So when I drew this, I knew there would be a problem, but I use that to find a curve that doesn't have a problem. So, so that's going to be the basic strategy. Um, and, uh, and it's easily applied to the disk. Um, but the question is whether I can use that same, that same idea in more complex configurations. Um, so, so the disc was uh, one thing, but here I show something that is a much bigger challenge. Um, here is just one of our standard models where, where we have a insulator with a high voltage, um, disc at the base of it. And <coughs> we, uh, we have the expected if the fields are sharp, we have the expected of very high fields on the corners of the disc. Um, and of course that gives you the possibility of discharges um, off of the device. So typically we would round the corners. And in this case, if you look at the scales, I doubled the width of the disc to, to make it a little easier. And I rounded the corners and I assumed again, some maximum field, um, that, that we don't want to exceed and, and showed here that my rounding didn't get me there. So again, I can make a parametric like I showed earlier um, in order to, to uh, allow for fatter discs, larger radius, but of course the radius can't be so big that it hits the shed, but you know we'll have parameters that we can play with here and try to solve this problem. <clears throat> the, the question for me is, uh, is there a procedure using this kind of uh, essential Rogowski strategy in something far more complex than, than his formulas allow for? And, uh, and so here's what I did. I said, I want to get rid of the disk. Um, I want to go to uh, the simplest form of the problem that I can, 
which, which will for sure have an extreme problem, but I'm going to pick out the profiles which avoid the problem. So, so I drew it to simply have 20 kilovolts on the bottom surface, no, no disk at termination whatsoever. And, uh, and then I um, looked at the electric field and voltage contours and as expected, I have this extreme field and, and there's a very wide area where it exceeds my design criteria. But I look at voltage contours that map outside of that area. And I looked at a few that went well outside it because there's an additional complication in here that what I'm going to do is take a voltage profile that's president one of these values, for example, 1.686, but I'm going to assign it as 20. That means the E field will scale up as well. So I need to allow for that in my reasoning somehow. So what I did was to draw a line across everything and export graphs of E and V along that line. So I drew my line where it looked like the biggest E field problems are going to exist relative to the contours, put those into a spreadsheet and added a scaling column. So in this column, if you look in the formula, I say whatever is in, um, in the F column, which is the voltage at that point, I'm going to scale up to, to say, what if that was actually 20? And then the E field will scale up to 20. So my design criteria is I don't want to exceed 1.5. So I pick this corresponding to this voltage for where I don't exceed 1.5. Um, so so I, I drew that, that um, profile um, into the program. I basically solved it. For, for where is that voltage contour, I drew it in, and then I drew a fat electrode corresponding to that. And as you can see in the results, it worked. Um, I now have a fat electrode um, where the field is nowhere exceeding 1.5. And, uh, and yeah, job, job done. Um, it may look like I've used excessive copper because this is certainly a lot fatter. I'm not showing everything on the same size scale, but it's it's fatter, but you may notice it's not as large a radius as the disc I had before. So as compared to my first rounded fatter disc attempt, this is actually a smaller volume of copper. And if I want to, uh, for either manufacturing or copper conservation reasons, I can flatten it a lot. I can, I can say there's no essential problem in this whole area. So I'm actually just going to take a flat disc and then round the ends to, to conform to this. And if I do that, then you see, yeah, I've, I've now saved it some volume and maybe, maybe made an easier construction for these terminations um, by starting with a disc and then rounding the ends in some way. <clears throat> so, so that's uh, that's my illustration on uh, on a, a very different than Rogowski type of type of problem. Um, so I think with some thought, this this strategy that that can use software like ours uh, may actually allow you to efficiently design a lot of stuff that you might not have thought could be done this way. Um, Here's another illustration, just a generic triple point. If I have a, a um, insulator going to air between two parallel plates, down in one corner or the other, I'm going to get a triple junction if, if there's this angled interface. So this is not any anything real that I know of, and the solution might look a bit funny, but it's too illustrate a principle. Um, if you go back later and look at the previous slide, you may wonder why a triple junction wasn't made um, where the electrode touches 
touches the insulator. And it's because if anything, this method resolves triple junctions rather than creates them. And the reason is very simple. You see that, um, that anywhere in the middle here, um, there is no triple junction. So if I reshape to follow a voltage profile, there will be no triple junction. <clears throat> so, so that's what I did. I, I made it double the thickness, double the voltage, um, and uh, mapped out the voltage contours, as you see on the left here. Then uh, with a click of a button, I get Excel to, to find and, and trace out a couple of the voltage contours corresponding to half the width, and therefore the same original um, the same as the original device ultimately. So I create something long, which away from the junction is still just my parallel plates, but I've reshaped it around the junction in order to, to eliminate the triple voltage, so you see, or the triple point. So you see no um, excessive rapid increase in field around the point with my reshaped electrodes again, by following this strategy and using the simulation to kind of guide that. Um, so finally, I'm just going to point out that this principle of replacement is, uh, um, is uh, something that I just did without really justifying. It's well enough understood um, by mathematicians and people who do this, but I just, uh, I just wanted to illustrate that it's a very broad principle and it, its potential uses go way beyond the scope of what I've just been talking about. So to simply demonstrate that, um, I drew an arbitrary model where I have a large ground sheet and I have some high voltage wires above the ground sheet. Um, I think I specified here, I, I set them at 100 kilovolts or something, my meeting controls are in the way of some of my slide here. Um, but, uh, but then I showed the electric field near the ground plane and in a vertical line going above it. I then did the same thing as I demonstrated in 2D, except now I'm doing a surface. I, I made up a macro that would map out the five kilovolt um, virtual surface. So in here, if you were to plot a surface, where is the field five kilovolts, it would look like this. And I terminate, you know, ultimately it would wrap around. I don't actually need that. Um, I made up that surface. Then I outright deleted all the wires and applied five kilovolts to this surface. Now I solve again and I make the same plots. And you see the field everywhere inside, everywhere between the electrode and the surface that I made up and um, is identical to what I have from the wires themselves. So, so this is just to illustrate, it's a very broad principle and, and people can use this actually to simplify devices for simulation as one example. If I have an extremely complex situation and I wanna focus down on the bottom, one thing I can do is to is to replace the whole top with a with a simplified surface that I determine in one analysis, and then I can do much faster studies on the bottom part. So that that concludes uh, my presentation, and I think I may have even got Randy back on track time wise in the process. So, are there any questions? Uh, not yet, but if there are, I'll pass them on to you. All right. Okay. Thanks very much for the presentation. Very detailed, comprehensive presentation. And I can see all the applications for this. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much.